Hello, my name is Jason DeMora, and welcome back to By Faith Bible Studies. The first thing I'd like to address is what is going on with these recent posts. Well, as they talked about in the Proverbs 5 post, which I highly recommend you to watch before watching this video, I talk about how I had my wisdom teeth pulled out a couple weeks ago, and so I wasn't able to film that week. Very strange to lose your wisdom teeth when talking about Proverbs. I mean, you can't really learn about wisdom if you don't have any wisdom anymore. Whatever. But as I was posting that video, I had some technological difficulties and wasn't able to post it for another week, and that's why it was posted today. And so I highly recommend you to watch that video before, and now you see why these videos haven't been posted, and I'm going to see it as a sort of summer break that I took. Um, but really, it's important to watch that video first, because last week, we began the dark adventure into adultery. And we see how important it is to study this passage. And we look at this idea that God abhors adultery. And that adultery, even though it is not talked about as much in our society because we replaced it with other sexual morality in a sense, it still is a great sin and it is one that we should fight against. I then looked at this cross-reference and I think this is a very important cross-reference, so I'm going to read it again. Matthew 5, 27 through 30, where Jesus speaks about adultery. He says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Jesus really expresses two things here. First of all, that he takes adultery very, very seriously. And that it is a sin that must be fought. Because in a physical metaphor that is a metaphor for a spiritual reality, if part of you is causing you to sin, destroy it. Get it out of you. Run from that temptation. And then secondly, he speaks about how lust, in a sense, is a form of adultery. Lust is a form of adultery. And so today, as I read Proverbs 6, what I want to do is focus on that idea, understanding that Proverbs 5-7 through is more specifically talking about adultery. I want to make that connection, and how lust, in a sense, is adultery, but more so, how lust leads to adultery. And really, that is how they are similar. Both come from that similar art heart attitude. So let me read Proverbs 6. And as I read Proverbs 6, you'll notice that verses 1 through 19 seem to not speak about adultery. They seem to speak about something else. And you're like, what is this talking about? Well, I hope that after we read it, we'll be able to make the connection. Let me read Proverbs 6. My son, if you have become surety for your neighbor, have given a pledge for a stranger, if you have been snared with the words of your mouth, have been caught with the words of your mouth. Do this then, my son, and deliver yourself. Since you have come into the hand of your neighbor, go, humble yourself, and importune your neighbor. Give no sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hunter's hand, and like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Observe her ways and be wise, which having no chief, officer, or ruler, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond, and your need like an armed man. A worthless person, a wicked man, is the one who walks with a perverse mouth, who winks with his eyes, who signals with his feet who points with his fingers, who with a perversity in his heart continually devises evil, who spreads strife. Therefore, his calamity will come suddenly. Instantly, he will be broken and there will be no healing. There are six things which Yahweh hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. My son, 
Observe the commandments of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk to you. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is light and reproofs for discipline are the way of life to keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her capture you with her eyelids. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread, and an adulteress hints, hunts for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is the one who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. Men do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is hungry. But when he is found, he must repay sevenfold. He must give all the substance of his house. The one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. He who would destroy himself does it. Wounds and disgrace he will find, and his reproach will not be blotted out. For jealousy enrages a man, and he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not accept any ransom, nor will he be satisfied, though you give many gifts. This is the words of the living God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that as we look at this passage, a passage once again on adultery and how a young man should address these things, Lord, that we would be humbled and realize how close we are to committing the sin, for all of us are close to sin. Unless, of course, we know what that is, sin is, and we prevent ourselves from it, and we fight against it through wisdom and through discernment and through fearing you, Lord, and trusting on your strength. So may you give us strength to fight against these sins, to understand them, to abhor them, and to fight them. Amen. Proverbs 5-7 through have been a deeply personal section for me to study and have been hard to study. When we went through 1 Kings 1-11, through it was speaking about Solomon and his story, and I found it deeply fascinating. And I learned a lot from there and learned a lot about who the real Christ is in reflection of the fallen Christ. And then when we went to Ecclesiastes, I got a new view of death and how to live in light of death and how to live life rightly and wisely. And then Proverbs 1 through 4 once again spoke about wisdom and how to live wisely and how to, you know, read your Bible more often and pray and fear God. But Proverbs 5 through 7 hits a different note. And the reason is because... I'm not qualified to talk about adultery because I'm not married. And I spoke about that last week, and I just want to repeat that. But I'm also not qualified to talk about lust, which is what we're going to be focusing on today, because I'm still struggling day in and day out. But on the other hand, I think that is the point of these Proverbs, the point of why there are three of them back to back, the point that Solomon speaks them to his young son, especially his son compared to his daughter, because it is true that sons struggle with these things more than daughters would. However, both do struggle. And it's important to understand that that is the focus here to this young man. And I think it is a sin that we all struggle with at times, and one that I definitely struggle with and am struggling with day in and day out. So as I say that, I want to you understand that this sermon, this message that I give is almost in a sense a prayer to myself, that I may study this proverb more, that I may fear God more, that I may see the destruction more clearly, and that I may be equipped with the Holy Spirit to a greater extent so that I may be able to fight this sin. Now jumping in, Proverbs 6, 1 through 19 seem to not speak about adultery at all. Instead, Proverbs 6, 1 through 19 speak about something else. And I'll label this section laziness. That 1 through 19 really speak about laziness. And they speak about three different types of lazy people. And how does this connect to adultery? Is this just randomly thrown in there? Well, here's the idea. Excuse me. Lazy people are those who are lustful. 
Lazy people lead to lustful people. Adulterers are lazy people. Lustful people are lazy people. Because really they came from the same heart attitude of laziness and lack of want for the truth, lack of want for wisdom, and a lack of the fear of Yahweh. So let me read this section and let's really get into it. Our first subheading will be the lazy earner, verses 1 through 5, the lazy earner. In verse 1 it says, My son, if you have become surety for your neighbor, have given a pledge for your stranger. What is that talking about? Well, it's a little confusing, and I had to look at some commentaries and listen to some sermons on it, but I think I figured it out. Basically, it's this. It's really quality economic advice, what he's giving here in verses 1 through 5. And the economic advice is that if your neighbor is getting a loan or is borrowing money from a third party and he wants a sort of insurance you serve as that insurance. What happens is that if your neighbor cannot fulfill that loan, you will pay it for him. But then you add this caveat that you want a payment for this service, that you want a little bit of money from the stranger for the service. However, there's a risk involved because if the stranger is not able to pay the loan and you have to fill the loan, then you are paying more than you are gaining from the stranger for the service. This would make sense if you were doing it in a sort of business venture or in a more with somebody you knew, but this is for a stranger. And the idea here is that that's just bad economic thinking because you don't know this person. You don't know if they have enough money. And really what you're trying to do is get money out of a stranger without really doing anything. You're gambling, you're risking, and you're probably going to lose all of your money in the process. The stranger won't be able to pay the loan. You'll pay it for him and you will be bankrupt. So if you have been snared with the words of your mouth in this way, have been caught with the words of your mouth, do this, my son, deliver yourself. Go, humble yourself and importune your neighbor. Understand you've done something silly, foolish, economically stupid and fix it. Give no sleep to your eyes nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hunter's hand and like a bird from the hand of the fowler. This is an interesting section in this economic advice, and I think it's also interesting understanding the writer, that Solomon made some quality economic decisions, and he kept Israel in one of the most prosperous economic ecosystems that it has ever been in. And so here he's really giving his son quality economic advice. But it's also really a more general idea to use your riches wisely. Deuteronomy 16, 17, which Solomon most definitely had in his mind when he wrote this, reads this, Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessings of Yahweh your God, which he has given you. You are not giving as you are able. You are not using the blessings of Yahweh your God rightly and wisely if you are trusting in the power of a stranger, if you are giving your wealth to a stranger. Ecclesiastes 11, 1 through 6 that we looked at when we were in Ecclesiastes, talks about casting your bread on the surface of water, giving generously. But this section neither talks about this and also is not supporting this idea, this economic foolishness. Rather, this section is once again talking about using your riches wisely and using them to give to others, to give your talents and such to others. But once again, in a wise manner, this is not wise. And it's a similar idea to lust. Because here, the young man thinks he can get rich without working. And lust is a similar idea because you think you can find love without being loving. You think that you can find love without being loving. What do I mean by that? Well, in a perfect biblical sense, love comes through marriage. Love, as in sexual intimacy, comes through marriage and the general love of marriage. But the young man doesn't want to work for that. He doesn't want to try for that. He doesn't want to put in the effort for that. Rather, he thinks he can find love without actually being loving at all. He doesn't want to make himself an upstanding man so that he can even care for a wife or be presentable to a woman. No. 
He wants it to find it in other means. He wants to gain his riches in other means. And those means are through lust, be it through pornography, be it through lusting people on the streets, be it through any of those types of means. He's trying to find love without being loving, without the right path towards love, with the right path towards marriage, which is harder. He wants to earn something without actually working for it. And that leads us to our next section, which I think speaks about a very similar heart attitude. The lazy worker, verses 6 through 11. The lazy worker. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Observe her ways and be wise, which having no chief, officer, or ruler, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. This is such an interesting section talking about the ant, and if you've ever seen ants or learned anything about ants, which honestly I'm not an ant expert, it's fascinating how hard working they are, how much effort they put in. They can carry food to two times their weight. I believe that's the accurate statistic. And they work so hard and they keep the ant community alive, and they are never lazy. And so this metaphor that is in nature for the instruction of the follower of God, of the one who fears God and is looking for wisdom, is here now presented to Solomon's son. And he says, do not be lazy. Be like the ant. Work. Do not be a lazy worker. And it flows well from verses 1 through 5 because if you don't work, you aren't going to earn. And so that's why the young man tried that economic endeavor, because he didn't want to work. But 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says this, and this is a funny verse, yet I think it's so practical, and it's kind of thrown out there, but I think it's so important. For even when we were with you, Paul says, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Work is a gift from God. Work is a necessity. You should work. You are called to work, especially this young man, this young man who doesn't want to work, who wants to sit around, who thinks he can earn without working. He's lazy. Work is the way to earning, not laziness. In Ecclesiastes, when we looked at Ecclesiastes, there were many sections about work and how important work is. The one I'll turn to is Ecclesiastes 5, 18 through 20. It says here, here is what I have seen to be good and fitting to eat, to drink, and to enjoy oneself in all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him. For this is the reward. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. For he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. Labor is a gift from God, and the fruits of that labor are a gift from God. That is the way to riches, temporal and eternal, because it is a command from God, and you are to follow that command, leading to eternal reward. But there's a a word in here that I think is so interesting. It says, if you work, and that if you receive the blessings from your work, you will be occupied. And I think this teaches us a lesson about lust. If your mind is on work and godly things, your mind isn't on lust. The lazy person has time aplenty to have lustful thoughts. Time aplenty. But the one who is working and thinking on godly things, the one who is spending his time wisely and is tired at the end of the night and wants sleep, not sexual morality, their mind is occupied with right things and their mind is not on lust. I think we can find that practical application from this idea that the lazy person, the lazy person is quick to lust because they have so much time. Why not? There is so much time. Why not burn some of it in lustful desires? And once again, this leads back to that heart attitude. The lazy boy who doesn't want to work for riches also doesn't want to work for true love. See, from the man's perspective, and this is very biblical, it is almost always the case. In fact, the biblical case, we see this all the way back into Genesis, that the man works 
Adam worked. Then Eve was created as the helper. And then they were married and became one flesh. The man became a respectable person. Adam became a respectable person who was working. And especially in a fallen world where work is necessary for economic success, work is important. And work is one of the main ways that you're going to be able to even get to marriage, get to love. You can't care for a family if you do not work. So I don't want that. I don't want children. I don't want a wife. I don't want any of that. I just want love. And so they find this fake, flimsy love in lust, in adultery, in lusting after these things that they cannot have because they are too lazy to find them. And let me tell you, I've fallen into that trap and it's dangerous. Wait, work, earn, wait for marriage. It's so much better. As I said, I've not committed adultery and I'm not married, so that's not even possible. But I definitely have committed the sins of lust. And those sins, I can tell you, they come from this heart attitude of laziness. And it's also a heart attitude of being a lazy Christian. Verses 12 through 19, the lazy Christian. Now, this section, which I'm about to jump into, is clearly talking about an unbelieving, wretched sinner. But I want to apply it to this idea of the lazy Christian. And I use quotations because are they really a Christian at all? Let me read this section. A worthless person, a wicked man, is the one who walks with a perverse mouth, who winks with his eyes, who signals with his feet, who points with his fingers, who with a perversity in his heart continually devises evil, who spreads strife. This is a wicked, worthless person. Why is this here? Well, these Proverbs aren't all perfectly connected, and really it is just another call to not be the worthless person, but I think we can make this connection to the lazy Christian. And in context, I think it can be applied to sanctification. Because if you're lazy in sanctification, and not fighting sin, and not becoming that worthless, wicked person who is perverse and deceitful, sin will destroy you. In Genesis 4, 7, we read this, and I think this is a very important passage for what we're talking about. Genesis 4, 7. If you do well, this is God speaking to Cain. If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you. But you must master it. If you do not fight sin, if you do not war against this sin, the sin of lust, it will destroy you. And some people looking at the text and other texts and the Hebrew language would say that it's also this image of a wild sexually aroused animal banging at the door and if you open it for a moment it will destroy you and consume you if you allow the flesh to take over and you become that worthless wicked person sin will destroy you a little lust and soon you're committing much and much worse sins And so you must fight it in sanctification. But also, if you're lazy in sanctification, if you're not realizing who you were before, but rather, and if you're not realizing who you were before and that you are no longer that person, but rather are living in that old lifestyle, is there any real Christianity in you? 1 John 2, 3 through 6 addresses this. 1 John 2, 3 through 6 reads, By this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. If you say you are a Christian, yet commit sins over and over again, you fall into the sin of lust. Are you really a Christian at all? 
ask yourself this, ponder this, because if you are not a Christian, then you are still a worthless, wicked person. You are full of deceit and calamity will come suddenly and you will be broken and there will be no healing. There is judgment on the sinner. There is judgment on the one who commits lust, and there is no repentance in their heart. There is destruction for those who do not take Christianity seriously, because if they do not take Christianity seriously, then they are not a Christian at all. The other thing I want to note is how similar this section is to Proverbs 5, 1 through 6. Proverbs 5, 1 through 6, speaking about another deceitful, wicked person, and that is... The adulterer. Proverbs 5, I'll actually begin in verse 3. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey and smoother than oil is her speech. But in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable. She does not know it. The adulteress is deceitful. The wicked man is deceitful, deceitful to himself. He convinces himself he's a Christian, but really he's not. He's this lazy, quote-unquote Christian that is not Christian at all, that is committing iniquity, that is falling into lust, that is lazy, that has the wrong heart attitude and does not take life seriously. Then we head into 16 through 19, which epitomize this section and state the things which Yahweh hates. This, like the section on the end, is a very well-known passage. Let me read it again. There are six things which Yahweh hates, yet seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. This is the wicked person. This is the sinful person, and it's a sort of summary of everything he spoke of before in 12 through 15. That if you are a wicked, worthless person, then you are full of a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plan, feet that run rapidly to evil. And you'll notice that these descriptions really also apply to the adulterers that we talked about in chapter 5. That she has these attributes. So if you also have these attributes, then how different are you? The other thing that's interesting is in these seven things which Yahweh hates, using the seven to show perfection, that these is really a full list of the things which God hates. Notice, adultery is not specifically listed. Well, why is that? Well, it's because he's about to get into it. He's about to spend the next 15, 16 verses speaking about adultery. Because that's how important it is. That's how important lust is. The lazy person leads to the lustful person and the adulteress. So what we've seen in verses 1 through 19 is this lazy earner and this lazy worker who does not take Christianity seriously and thus is really not a Christian at all who does not fight the sin of lust, but sits around and allows sin like a sexually aroused animal to destroy them, to take their life away. This is the danger of laziness. Do not be lazy. Work towards marriage, knowing that the benefits of marriage, those earnings are so much better than cheating through lust, cheating through sexual immorality. Do not be the lazy Christian lest you be the rocky soil, lest you not be a Christian at all. Jumping into our second section, lust, 20 through 35. Lust, verses 20 through 35. The first thing that we see here is in these three steps towards disaster. We see the foolish one's initial ignorance. The first step towards total disaster is the foolish one's initial ignorance. This is verses 20 through 24. My son, observe the commandment of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continuously on your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk to you. For the commandment is the lamp and the teaching is light and reproofs for discipline are the way of life. This is a very memorable call to listen to a parent's instruction. 
And this time, as with last in Proverbs 5, it is aimed at connecting with the evils of adultery. We say that next verse, to keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. See, the fool's first step towards total destruction is his initial ignorance. He steps towards adultery and he commits lust because he forgets the commands from those before him. He ignores his parents, his mentors, his church. He ignores all of them. And he runs towards sin and lust. Because as we see in the case of Solomon and in Rehoboam, wisdom is easy to lose. You can teach it, you can hear it, and you can lose it. Somebody explained it to me. It's like, like a bird that you have to catch and hold on to. But in a moment, the bird of wisdom flies away. That's why in this section, dictions such as observe, do not forsake, bind, tie is so important because wisdom has to be this way of life that is permanently part of you, holding on to it as fast as you can, but also understanding that in our fallen nature, it cannot be permanently part of you. Thus, you must catch the bird again and again, holding it on as hard as you can, listening to parents, listening to church mentors, and so forth. Because wisdom is a way of life, as seen here. When you walk, when you sleep, when you awake, every part of you has to be focused on wisdom or you will fall short. And the foolish one's initial ignorance is that, ignoring these commands, running the opposite direction, saying, those teachings are not important. Those teachings do not apply to me. Proverbs 5 through 8, not important. I'm going to throw them aside. I haven't committed adultery. I've only committed lust. It's not a huge deal. But it is. Verses 25 through 29 talks about the lustful one's second stumble. The lustful one's second stumble. First, they ignore the commands of those before them. Then they commit lustful intent. Verses 25 says this, Do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her capture you with her eyelids. Then by verse 29, it says, So is the one who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. And so we have this progression from 25 talking about desire or lust and verses 29 speaking about adultery. One leads to another. James 1, 14 through 15, which I've definitely used in this series, James 1, 14 through 15 reads this. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. It is a sort of progression that one sin leads to the next sin and that sin leads to the next sin and soon you are in destruction. This is the lustful one's second stumble. And it's such a disastrous stumble because in verse 26 we see how devastating it is that when you give your life to the harlot or to the adulteress, they take your precious life the precious young life, and they reduce you to a loaf of bread, to poverty, to nothingness, that you're just being used, be it by the adulteress, the harlot, or the screen. Whatever it is, these people are controlling you, taking advantage of you, and destroying your precious life, and you're okay with it. That's what the lustful person does. That's their second stumble. They give in and allow themselves to lead from one sin to the next. How often have we fallen into this disaster with many, many different types of sins, but here applied to lust. Verses 27 through 29, I think, are very powerful. Sorry, 27 through 28 are very powerful metaphors. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? You think, oh, I'll get away with it. I have control. It's just a little sin. I'm just having a little lust in my heart for that woman. Just a little. I'm just thinking a little terrible thoughts. Only once. But you have no control. And soon you are falling into deeper and deeper sin. Jeremiah 17, 9 is a very memorable verse. You've definitely heard of it before. Jeremiah 17, 9. Let me turn there. Reads this, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? 
You almost don't have control over your own heart. But the verse goes on, and I think the next verse is even more powerful. I, Yahweh, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. You may be deceived by your own heart, and you may be trying to deceive others, but you are desperately sick, and Yahweh knows all. He searches the heart, tests the mind, and He will give to each man what he deserves. And for the lustful one, that is destruction. Lust leads to adultery, as we see in verse 29. And adultery leads to judgment. There is eternity at stake here. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. And I love how it says here, whoever touches her. Now, this could be t talking about sexual immorality, but I don't think so. I'm sorry, sexual intimacy, but I don't think so. Because in verse 29, the first half, so is the one who goes into his neighbor's wife. I think that's pretty obviously sexual intimacy. I think the second half is talking about lust again. This idea of, oh, you just touched her. You just kissed her. You just thought about her. You will not go unpunished. As Matthew 5, 27-30 reminds us, if one part of you is causing you to sin, cut it out. Cut it out. Make drastic measures to fight against this second stumble, the lustful one's second stumble, because soon it will lead to greater and greater evil, and that evil will lead to judgment. And soon you'll realize you're not just a lazy Christian, you're not a Christian at all. And Christ is not your Savior. And that leads us to the third section, the judged one's fatal finale. Verses 30 through 35, the judged one's fatal finale. In the first few verses, it has this interesting sort of metaphor or example. It talks about a thief. Men do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is hungry, but when he is found, he must repay sevenfold. He must give all the substance of his house. It's this idea that the judgment on the poor thief still happens, even if the thief is not despised. Say, he goes and he steals because he has no food, and so he goes and he steals. He's not despised for that. It's understandable, you know, he has to steal. He has to get food, yet he's still judged. And that was true with this Old Testament time. Exodus 22, 1-4, which we'll not turn to here, talks about this judgment and talks about how there will be judgment on the thief. It doesn't matter if he was starving, he will still be judged. Now, the one who commits adultery, he is hated by society. And there will be even greater judgment on him. And because of this, the one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. He would destroy himself who does it. If you commit lust, you are lacking sense. How often sense, wisdom, leaves us when we fall into this sin. You are lacking sense and you are destroying yourself because one thing leads to the next and the next and the next and soon wounds and disgrace he will find and his reproach will not be blotted out. And then verses 20, 34 through 35 speak about this idea of the jealous husband. That the jealous husband comes in and finds that you have gone into his wife and he will destroy you and in the modern time this definitely would have happened and i know it happens now but we don't see it as much i'm not saying it doesn't happen but we don't see it as much however god is a jealous god and he will act in a sense as that jealous husband and he will destroy you there is temporal and eternal judgment on hand this is the judged one's fatal finale he thinks he can get away with it he thinks he has control, but he does not. And soon judgment comes and he is dead, temporally and eternally lost. This is the path of the one who commits lust. Just a little sin, just a little ignoring of the truth, just a little not listening. And soon it's a habit. Soon it's a routine. Soon the screen has control of your life. Soon 
You've fallen into that lustful second stumble, and then before you know it, you're at the fatal finale. It is so hard to fight this sin. Now, I want to say this, and this is very important because I have gone through the first steps of these struggles. As I said, I've not committed adultery, but I've definitely committed lust. And I want to say this, and this is very important. I'm still a Christian, and I still believe in Jesus. And I know that when I ask for forgiveness, he forgives. And if you ask for forgiveness, he will forgive. And if you commit the iniquity again, he will still forgive you. There's a difference, though. If it is a habit where you love the sin to an extent that you have literally no control because you are a slave to sin, then you are not a Christian at all. And lust will lead to damnation. On the other hand, if you are a Christian, then may we hold on to the what Paul says in Romans 7 where he says, I am fighting against this sin and I'm fighting and I'm fighting and I keep losing, but I'm still fighting. And may this sin if it is part of your life, lead you to trust in God more. May it lead me to trust in God more, trusting in Him that He forgives and that He gives the strength to fight any sin at all. And may we fight this sin harder and harder so that before we know it, we can see that we are no longer that old person, that we are no longer the worthless, wicked man, but we are free from sin and we can fight this sin. It is a hard sin to fight because our society supports it. Our society allows it. Our society encourages it. It's easy, but it's lazy. It is lazy not to fight against lust. And it is lazy to think that lust won't lead to adultery and adultery won't lead to damnation. I want to bring up a little story. A couple days ago, I went and watched this film, The Sound of Freedom. Fantastic film, highly recommend. The Sound of Freedom is about child trafficking and fighting against child trafficking. About this character, Tim Ballard, true story, goes in and rescues a whole bunch of children who are trafficked. And the focus is on children being trafficked for sexual exploitation. And that is why I believe this film is being hated on so much. If you look at the news, there is many, many people who have said that it is supporting conspiracy theories. It's not statistically correct and all of this, which makes no sense because the person who it's actually about, this character Tim Ballard, supports the film. And I believe this is why the film is being hated on. Because in interviews, Tim Ballard and some other people have said this, and I think it's very important, is that pornography and the support of pornography in our society, the allowance of it is so dangerous because one step leads to the next, and the next, and the next. And soon, we've created pedophiles in our society. We've gone from allowing pornography to such a great extent, and now we're even on the road to calling pedophiles minor attracted people. That's terrible. That's terrible. And I truly believe that that's why this film is being hated on, because there are sinful people who do not want this to be realized. The devil does not want you to realize that this sin is crouching at your door. Sexual morality of any kind is crouching at the door. And it is so dangerous. And it leads to the adulterous. And it leads to the path of hell. And I want to ask this question. You may say, Jason, how can you even ask this? But I think it's important. And I think this is how the Christian should address sin. How far are you from being like those characters in The Sound of Freedom? How far are you like from being those people who are against the film just because you want to continue in your lustful desires? How far are we? And I think the response, as we see in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and many other places in the Bible, is that we used to be just like them, wretched sinners. Maybe not in the same exact sin, but still wretched all the same. And now that we are Christians, may we not be lazy in our sanctification. But may we be hard workers fighting against these sins so that we may be able to run in the opposite direction. That we may be able to champion this film and fight against these sins in our society and in our own hearts. How far are we from adultery? How far are we from sexual perversion? And I would argue 
that if we do not take sanctification seriously, if we do not take these things seriously, we are very close and not very far at all because sin is crouching at the door. And if you do not master it, it will master you. I want to end by turning to 1 John 2, 15 through 17. 1 John 2, 15 through 17 reads this, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Lusts are passing away. Let us fight them. Let us stand strong. Let us be strong in our salvation, strong in fighting for Christ, strong in our sanctification, and not be lazy, but rather be fighters, fighting lust, realizing how dangerous of a sin this can be. Thank you, and I'll see you next week.